Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Christchurch. Welcome online, if you're joining us online as well. It's great to see you here this morning. Happy Father's Day to you out there. It's a, it's a, it's a great day. It's a day where we remember and we honor fathers uh, amongst us, whether they be physical or spiritual fathers. And uh, it reminds us of actually, because God is the perfect father. God is the one who sets the standard of what fatherhood should be. Obviously, for some, it's a sad day. For some, it's a difficult day, whether their dad is no longer here on earth with us, or whether actually when they're growing up, their dad wasn't present or wasn't very nice uh, to them as well. So we uh, recognize that on a day like today. But you know, the Bible tells us that God is the perfect father. God is the one who draws near to the fatherless. He's the one who draws near to those who have no dad. God is the one who sets the standard for dad. He is, he is present, firstly. He is, the, he is true. He is faithful. He is full of steadfast love. Psalm 103, verses 6 to 14, tells us. He is gracious. He is kind. He is patient. He doesn't tolerate evil. He protects his people. He is compassionate, and he is full of empathy as well. And 1 John 3, verse 1, wonderfully tells us that for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we come to God as our Heavenly Father. We've been adopted into his family. So God is here, and he wants to meet with you. And you know, as we were praying beforehand in the, in the prayer meeting before uh, church, there was just that real sense, actually, I, I had this, this sense of God uh, saying he wanted to meet with people in an individual way. You know, we're in an age of mass communication where you can communicate to millions of people with just a click of a button. And we all get those mass emails and advertisements that come our way. But God wants to meet with you in a personal way. You're not just a number. You're not just a, a, a you know, sort of a face in, in a crowd. He knows you individually. He knows the hairs on your head. And he wants to meet with you this morning. So um, I'm just going to pray for us. And then actually we're going to watch a little video about uh, Father's Day and then I'm going to hand over to the band to, uh, a worship, uh, to lead us in a time of worship. But Heavenly Father, thank you that you are here. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that for each one of us in this room, Lord God, whether we had a great dad or not, Lord God, whether our dad is here um, or not, Lord God, you know our situation, Lord God. You know us individually. And Lord, you want to meet with each individual in this room. You want to pour out your love into their heart, Lord God. You want to show them your father heart, Lord God. And I just pray that you would meet with each one of us this morning, Lord God, whether it be a, a happy day or a difficult day, Lord God, I pray your Holy Spirit would just come and that you would speak to each person afresh. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I think my dad is great because he is nice and he likes basketball. My dad's awesome because he's really good at cricket and bowling and, um, yeah, he's really good and uh, he's really good at football and he's really good at stuff and he's a good dad to have. Oh, I like my dad because he's kind of generous and makes the best pizza. I love my dad because he's gen generous and, he, and he's kind to people in Africa. My dad's great because um, he's always interested in doing stuff with me and always wants to spend time with me. The great about my daddy is... Daddy is great at that game. And daddy is amazing at that game. I love my daddy because he's always there for me when I need him and he loves me. 
I love my daddy because he, because he always be nice to me and has lots of fun with me. I I love my dad because um, he's really kind to me and he helps me and I like playing with him. I love my dad because he helps. My dad's great because he loves me and he's very kind to me and he gets me stuff. Say why you love daddy. Um. What makes daddy amazing? I have that. We. That done does. I have to set And we. Talk. I that win. One time and I have made way much power. And before. Do we act? great isn't it just interesting how children see things i love the way that um uh, uh I his name edward wasn't it uh, said that my dad's great at that and then they saw, saw a video of his dad losing that game actually but no, never mind never mind but you know so how kids perceive things you know but god is the perfect father he is the one who loves us and he wants to meet with us so let's stand let's worship him whatever you're feeling at the moment he is worthy of your praise and he wants to wrap his arms of love around you this morning.
really worshiping God remind me of um, yesterday we, we were in London and we took our kids into Harrods. You know that staircase in the middle? Never been in there before. The amazing Egyptian one. Well, we, we, me and Sarah were going up it going, God, this is amazing. Look at this. Like, look at all the sphinx on the side of the wall and the lights. And there's like stained glass. And then we turned around and saw that all of our children were trying to work out how they could climb off the escalator, get onto the lights or onto the sphinx, and then like parkour up to the top. And we were just like, no, that's not the sort of thing you do in Harrods. Um, but I just felt God remind me of it um, because I just felt for when we worship, you know, we discipline our hearts and our minds to engage with the wonder and awe of God. And actually what God wants to remind some people here is stop trying to climb off stuff. Stop trying to be busy all the time. Stop your mind thinking about what you're going to do at work this week. How you're going to um, get out of this situation that you're in. What you're going to do about your family relationships. All of those things that go round and round in our minds. Actually, Jesus wants you to discipline your heart and your soul to come before him in worship. And to just be in awe and wonder of how wonderful he is. Don't leave this worship time thinking, oh, I've kind of resolved how I'm going to do that. Leave this worship time just being in awe and wonder of who Jesus is and how much he loves you.
I, I often get told, get caught talking to myself very often. And, um, you know, I see in the Bible that uh, in Genesis where God says, let us make man in our image. We see that, we see the Trinity speaking to each other. And um, so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they, they, they communicate. So in a, in a way, God speaks to himself. But um, I want to invite you to speak to yourself this morning as, as we, as from what Anna said as well, something Anna said uh, also um, it's very similar to what I'm about to say but I want to invite you this morning to get your mind to speak to your soul and say soul praise the Lord and we, we see this and we saw this in the first hymn and we see it in the hymns like tell out my soul and we're saying soul praise the Lord and isn't it wonderful when we come to worship our body our mind and our soul all come together in, and we worship God with our body our mind and our soul. So I invite you in the next song to do that. Tell your soul, command your soul to praise the Lord. That's it. So whatever you're feeling at the moment, let's listen to those two words we've had this morning. Let's choose to worship God because he is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of everything. So whatever's going on in your life, for many, there's difficult things happening at the moment. But let's choose to worship God because he is worthy of your praise. Amen. I just brought to mind um, Psalm 42. It says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul longs for you, my God. My soul thirsts for you, for the living God. And then later it says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. I will yet praise him my saviour and my God.
serve an amazing God and uh, kids you've beha- behaved so well so far do you want to make your way out to your groups now and uh, learn more about this amazing God that we worship lovely dancing girls at the front here that was really good go and enjoy your group learn more about God for the rest of us let's continue to engage let's not disengage we've had two words this morning about let's telling ourselves speaking to ourselves to worship God because he is worthy of our praise. So just going to pray and then we're going to continue in worship for a bit longer. But let's choose to meet with God this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you that you're here. Thank you that you love us. Thank you, Lord, as we release the children to go to their group, Lord God, you tell us as adults to come to you like children, to have faith like children, Lord God. And Lord, I pray we would meet with you afresh, Lord God, as our Heavenly Father, even as we continue in worship in Jesus' name.
singing Holy Spirit come and fill me fall on me and uh, you know Dunk just brought a word there actually sparked by what Nay uh, read earlier um, from as a deer pants for the water about how uh, and later on it says why are you cast down my soul I will again praise the Lord and uh, the Bible says this in Ephesians 3 these amazing words that Paul writes about how why he prays to God he says that so that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And then it goes on to talk about the love of God. And God wants to pour out his love on you afresh this morning. And he does that by filling you with his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here and he wants to meet with you. So I'm just going to pray that the Holy Spirit would fall on us and that he would meet with us. And then we're going to sing that refrain again. And we're just going to allow God to meet with us before we bring this section to a close. We're just going to give God space to pour out his spirit into your heart now. Lord, thank you. That's your desire. Thank you that you said, Lord Jesus, when you ascended on high, that you would pour out your spirit. Lord God, that you would refresh us, that we would have streams of living water flowing out from us. Lord God, thank you. That's the gift of the new age, Lord God, of the new covenant that you won with your blood. And Holy Spirit, I just welcome you here this morning, Lord. Would you fall on each person in this room? Lord, we're hungry for you. Lord, we're hungry to meet with you. Thank you that when your spirit pours out on our hearts. We, we know your love. We know your transforming power. We know you as our Abba Father, as our Daddy. So Holy Spirit, just come. Have your way amongst us this morning. Move on each person, Lord God, whether they know you or not, Lord God. I pray, would you just come and reveal yourself afresh in a deeper way. Fall on us, I pray. Fill us, Lord God. That's our desire. Come, Lord. Come, Lord.
welcome into your hearts as the music just plays just just welcome him to fill you afresh to reveal more of God into your life he wants to meet with you individually this morning we thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love Lord God and because of your great love for us Lord God we in turn love you Lord God you have transformed us and Lord we just thank you for your presence here we thank you for your care we thank you that each one of us is not just a number Lord God you know us by name and you know the hairs on our head. You know all the days that ordained for us, Lord God. They were written in your book before one of them came to be. And Lord, we just stand in awe of you and say you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our lives. And we just surrender afresh to you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your great love. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. That was a lovely... Thank you, everybody. Great to have you here amongst us this morning. My name's Si. If you joined during the worship time and don't know who I am, not that that particularly matters, uh, the only person you really need to know this morning is the Lord Jesus. He's the, he loves you with an everlasting love. And I know most of us in the room do know him, but not all of us, I think. So, uh, yeah, he is here this morning, and he wants to meet with you. Great to be together this Father's Day. As I said at the beginning, it's a, it's a day where we honour fathers, where we uh, recognise uh, physical fathers and spiritual fathers uh, amongst us. And uh, it's good to be together to enjoy that. However, we also appreciate for some this is a sad day, this is a difficult day as uh, uh, your father, your dad may no longer be here or your your dad may not have been a particularly nice dad, and so it brings back some difficult memories to you. But God is the perfect father, and he loves you, and he wants you to know his love afresh this morning. And to all us fathers here, he is a, an example, that he is a standard that we think, okay, we, 
We are called to follow him. We are called through the power of his spirit to try and be more like him to our own children and to those around us. So, uh, yeah, happy Father's Day. I think after the service, for all the chaps in the room, uh, there will be some uh, uh, chocolates or something uh, like that as well. But anyway, I've got a few notices, and then we're going to continue um, in uh, uh, our worship by worshiping God in spirit and truth and listening to the truth of uh, God's uh, word uh, spoken to us by Rob this morning. But first note I've got to bring is is our uh, offering. We no longer pass the uh, buckets around as we used to at the moment due to uh, COVID and all that sort of thing. But there are, there are offering um, boxes by the door on the way out. Feel free to put your, your gifts in there. For those of you who are regular, many of you will do this by standing order. All that we do is done through voluntary donations here at a church, uh, as a church. Uh, if you're a visitor here, please feel no obligation to give. Uh, we're not after your money or anything like that. We want you to meet with God uh, this morning. That's our heart. Uh, and if that's you're a regular here and that's your heart, you want people to meet with God, then I encourage you to keep giving to the work uh, amongst us. Uh, baptisms. We have baptisms on the 3rd of July uh, at Ashburnham at 3 p.m. So if you're wanting to get baptized, Jesus says, believe and be baptized. It's a command of, uh, of him. It's one of the signs that we're his d- uh, true disciples. When we've given our life to him, we surrender our life, and baptism is a sign of uh, what he has done in our life. So if you want to be baptized, please come and speak to me at the end. I'd love to uh, talk to you more about that. If you're watching online and you'd like to be baptized, please contact the office and we'll uh, let you know how. Uh, we'll give you some details about that. Uh, then finally, final uh, notice I've got to give this morning. You know, we are producing a load of really good stuff on on the uh, media at the moment, on our website, on the, on Facebook, or podcasts that we're producing. Can I encourage you guys to uh, to listen to them? You know, we're influenced by so many things uh, these days. You know, uh, whether it be on TV or on the internet and that sort of thing. Well. I'd encourage you to let what we're producing here to be one of the things that influences you, that you make time to listen to, to watch. There's a lot of good stuff going on at the moment. And the most recent podcast we released was uh, done by um, Ello and Anne and talking on the whole subject of bereavement. So I'd encourage you to uh, listen uh, to that. But that's it from me. Without further ado, should we welcome Rob to bring us God's word this morning? Good morning, thank you. Just as I got up my mic, went for a wonder. Let me just give me a sec. Cool, super. Great. Let me just get myself ready. Good morning to you all, um, and happy Father's Day again to all the dads. Lovely to have you with us, and lovely for those joining us online as well. So today is our Father's Day service, a chance to uh, celebrate our dads, to remember um, all that they've done for us, to stop and think about what it means to be a dad. Um, Also to remember those, as I said, who are no longer with us as well. It's a chance, as the video we saw earlier shows us, to stop and think about what makes our dads special, what makes them unique. And a chance to think about what it actually means to be a dad on Father's Day. It's a wonderful privilege to be a dad, and also mirrored with that a great responsibility to be a dad, to be a father as well. Um, actually, I didn't actually introduce myself at the beginning. Um, as I said, my name's Rob. I'm one of the leaders here at the church. Um, I'm a dad. Um, along with Georgie, we have two kids, Eve and Neo, 14 and 12 years old. So reaching their teenage years, pray for us. Um, <laughs> I've had to kind of get permission to, with them what I could say and what I couldn't say today. So um, there's a number of stories I would have loved to have shared. It would have fitted in nicely, but I won't share them today. I was there at the the birth of both of them, um, and they still rank up there with probably two of the greatest moments in my life. Um, And I will say publicly, I'm so proud of Georgie um, for delivering them. Um, And yeah, I'll never forget those days when they were both born. I held babies before they were born. You know, you can read about it, you can talk about it, you can be amongst other parents, but there's nothing quite like being a parent. And then suddenly it hits you. 
I think I might have shared this before, but when uh, Eve was born, uh, my first, I helped the uh, midwife to get her dressed into her first baby growing nappy, and I couldn't really do it. I couldn't quite pull her arms in through the holes and put it on because I was worried I was going to break her. I'm, and then when she was handed to me and I held her for the first time, I held her and I didn't move. I didn't move for so long that my arm actually went numb because in my head I thought, if I move, she might, you know, something might happen, she might break. And I'd held babies before, but suddenly this was different, being my own. Because it hit me suddenly, the, the, the weight of being a parent and what that really meant. I don't know about you, but when I watch TV shows or films and there's that strong storyline about parents and children, it hits me because I suddenly relate to it in a way I couldn't before. And even more than that, being a parent myself has suddenly helped me understand what it means for God to love us, understanding his unconditional love that never stops. Once you're a parent, it, it means something different. In the Bible, we see that God is described as a father, and that's obviously what I want to talk about today, his father heart for us. Now, it's important right at the start to say that God doesn't have a gender. He's neither male nor female, but yet the Bible talks about him with masculine pronouns, and Jesus referred to him as father, so we can too. It is also, as Sai said, it's important to recognize that Father's Day isn't easy for everybody. Our experiences of fathers may be very different and could be quite negative. But I'd like to encourage us today to come with fresh eyes of faith today as we put the fatherhood of God first. Our understanding and expectations of human fathers and mothers should actually be out of what we see the Bible talk about God as father. Our understanding of human fathers should be shaped by a heavenly father who is perfect and not the other way around. So I'm going to look today at a passage in John 1, um, the first chapter of uh, John. If you have a Bible, you could turn with me to that. It will also be behind me. What I was preparing for this Father's Day talk, I really felt get God led me to this passage. And I hope you'll see why. So, John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, and not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So this passage is packed with so much truth, isn't it? We could probably do a whole series just on that one passage. It focuses on Jesus when it talks about the lights, when it talks about the word, the sun. It's all referring to Jesus. We see how Jesus was with God for all eternity. Jesus was there a part of creation, uh, of the whole universe, and part of their giving life. We see how Jesus, the light, came into the world. He was born human, yet rejected by many. And we see that those who received him, he gave a new birth to become children of God. And we read there in verse 18 at the end, no one has ever seen God in, in all his fullness, and yet it's Jesus, the Son, who makes him known. And that's what I'd like to really uh, focus on today. I'd like to look at how God is a father, and how we understand that through the revelation of Jesus, and look at what that relationship means for us today. So the concept of God as father, you see mostly in the New Testament. It's far more prominent there, but there are glimpses in the Old Testament which I'd just like to start at. 
You know, after all, God has not changed. He's always been a father. As Paul says in Ephesians 3, he says, God is the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. So he's the first father, the creator of all, the benchmark, if you will, of what a father is like. So I just want to start quickly in the Old Testament, a few verses from there. Fits nicely the first one, because we're looking at Exodus at the moment as our series as a church. And God spoke to Moses and said this. And he said, told Moses, say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. Or David in the Psalms said this, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. But I think for me, one of the most powerful examples of God as Father in the Old Testament is in Hosea chapter 11. This is what it says. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. What a beautiful image, isn't it, of God as father holding the hands of his child, teaching them to walk, a father who never stopped loving and supporting them. You know, if you look closely, sadly there, it says that the more God loved them, the more they went away after other things. And yet God never stops loving. Later in that passage, in verse 8, it says, God said, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? My compassion grows warm and tender. So there are examples in the Old Testament of God as Father, and we see him still there, loving and compassionate. But it's far more prominent, as I said, in the New Testament, because that's when Jesus came. Jesus said himself in John 6, no one has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. So today we're going to focus on how Jesus is the one who comprehensively shows us or reveals to us what God the Father is like. And so there's different ways, I think, that he shows us that, he reveals the Father. And the first is his teaching. And for example, his parables would be a great way to look at God as Father. One of the most well-known parables, I think, that shows this best is the parable of the prodigal son. You can find it in Luke 15. Simon so mentioned it a bit briefly last week. But to summarize, if you don't know the story, there are two sons uh, of, a, of the father. And the youngest son asks for his inheritance and wants all that's his. Now, obviously, you know, inheritance has come after a person passes away. So many people see this parable as quite insulting, that the son basically kind of wishes his father to be gone so he can have his inheritance now. However, the father does graciously give the son his inheritance. Probably a third up to maybe a half of everything. He was the younger son, so the older son would have had more. But the son takes it and runs squanders it, um, spends it very quickly on you know, loose living, wild living, to a point where he has nothing left and has to resort to eating pig food just to survive. He realizes how wrong he was and decides he's going to go home. He practices a speech to apologize to his dad, and he, off- and he thinks, if I go home, I could offer to just be a servant of my father. At least that way I'll get fed. Now, parables, remember, teach us um, about something about God, or perhaps how we relate to him or others. The, the characters are often representative of other people or God himself. So in this parable, when we read about the father of the prodigal son, we should understand it as God the father. When the son re- returns home, rock bottom, broken, ready to apologize, the father sees him from a long way off and runs to him. It's a beautiful picture of the father's running to his son who's returned. And as Sai said last week, that would be very undignified for a man in that culture to run. Even more undignified than Sai running after the bin men in his dressing gown. <laughs> I can't get that image out of my head, sorry. <laughs> the father embraces him, kisses him, puts a, a robe on him, a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, and then says, we need to celebrate, let's get a feast. I think that's an amazing picture of a father. If you think about everything that this father in the parable does for the child, it's quite amazing. He obviously provided for him, raised him, prepared an inheritance for him. He gave him independence and allowed him to make that choice to go. But at the same time, he was patient and waiting for his son to return. 
and even was willing to lower himself to be undignified for the sake of putting that relationship right. The father fully forgave the son. I think even before the chance, he had a chance to apologize. And if you read in the parable, the son doesn't get through his whole speech because his father's just too busy kissing him and hugging him. The father restores him, honors him, celebrates him. And this is how God is to us. Just like in Hosea, God never stops loving, even when the children turn away and run after other things. Another way that God, uh, Jesus reveals God the Father is through the relationship that he had with his Father. You know, the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us to pray to, to our Father in heaven. And that's not a religious thing we have to say by rote, but this is an invitation for us to commune with God in a personal, close relationship. Because that's how Jesus did himself. You see it in the way he prayed. Every time he prayed, he's praying to his Father. Throughout his time on earth, you see that Jesus constantly went to have uh, time alone with his father. That relationship he had with the father was the center of everything he did, wasn't it? He said he was here to do the will of his father, to do what his father commanded him. But I think what's important to note is that that relationship wasn't new. It didn't start when Jesus was born here. Jesus had that relationship all, for all eternity. If you think... In John 1, the opening chapter, the opening verse, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus and the Father had known and loved each other for all eternity. So it wasn't a new relationship. And if you look at Jesus' baptism, there's a powerful example of the Father's heart towards his Son. It's in Matthew 3, and it says that after Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, he came out of the water, and it says, The heavens were opened. And, we saw, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we see Jesus here as part of the Trinity. It was quite nice that, um, that Andy mentioned that as well this morning in worship. God is declaring his pleasure over the Son as the Holy Spirit rests on him as well. This is a demonstration for us, not for him, but for us to see this internal dynamic relationship that they had. But think about what, what the Father says. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. We see there that wonderful relationship of father and son, but also the nature of that relationship. You know, what a thing for a parent to say over a child. You know, this is my son or daughter. I am well pleased with them. And what I think is really interesting here is, is the timing of when God says this. If you know your Bible, you know that this, after the baptism, Jesus then was, went to the wilderness and then began, began his earthly ministry of healing and teaching, of fulfilling his Father's will, of going to the cross. And, but God says, I am well pleased before any of that. And that's important to note because God is declaring his eternal, unchanging, unconditional love of his Son. Not because of what Jesus had done, because he hadn't done anything yet or, you know, in terms of his earthly ministry. But this is how God loves. The Father has been pleased with his Son for all time, not dependent on what he did, but because that's how God loves. And that's how he loves us too, isn't it? Unconditionally. It reminded me of a, a, a talk I heard when the children were young, and I was listening to a, a talk about being a father. I'll be honest, I don't remember most of what was said, but there was one bit that stuck with me, and it still sticks with me now. And it was the responsibility that we have as, as parents to show the Father's love to our children. How we love them can demonstrate God's love. And perhaps they might have an understanding of God's grace. And in this talk, there was this little phrase that was suggested as a father that you could say when your child has misbehaved. And it went a bit like this. So imagine a child's done something, you would respond something like this. I love you when you listen. I love you when you completely ignore me. I love you all the time. You know, I love you when you say kind words. I love you when you say really unkind words. I love you all the time. To just highlight to the child, actually, that my love is not dependent on you doing the good things, and I love you less when you're doing the bad things. Actually, my love for you doesn't change whether it's good or whether it's bad. And I did say this a number of times to my children. I haven't said it for as much as I perhaps should have recently. But you know what, it always stopped and reminded me of God's grace and his love for me as much as hopefully what I was trying to extend to the children. You know, it's easy to say, but actually when you stop and consider God's love for us, it's, it's almost unbelievable. 
our, his love for us is not dependent on anything we do. Amen? And I just feel that perhaps there's a few here today, you need to hear that. God loves you all the time. He loves you when you've said really kind words to others. He loves you when he knows what you're already thinking. You know, he loves you when you read your Bible. He loves you when you didn't. He loves you all the time. You know, whatever it is you want to put in that, he loves you when. God loves love you, whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing. He loves you all the time. More than his teaching or the relationship, Jesus reveals God the Father in himself. See, the Trinity is far more than just a unique relationship between Father and Son. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are separate persons of the Trinity. Each are fully God. One, per- one God, three persons. And I would recommend you going back two weeks and listen to Sai's preach when he talked about the Holy Spirit and really expanded on the Trinity. It's really, really helpful. I'd also like to re- recommend a book, The Good God by Michael Reeves. If you want to know more about the Trinity, I found this one so, so helpful. And it's quite thin. <laughs> Honestly, if I can understand, I'm sure you all can. It's an easy, it's, I think it's an easy read to expand such a complex topic. So Jesus is fully God and fully man. We call this the incarnation, how God himself took on flesh to become human. In John 14, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. But then Philip, one of the disciples, says to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus says to him, you can always hear the frustration, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So Jesus is saying, if you want to see God the Father, then look at Jesus the Son. As parents, you know, it's, it's a privilege to see your children grow and develop, see um, how they change over time, how they find their interests and their talents. Often, George and I, you know, as, since the children have been young, have often joked about which bit of them comes from, from us. You know, who's, which of them have got our, my eye color, or their, well, neither of them are my eye color, but their, Georgie's eye color, my eye shape, perhaps, who's got whose nose, whose fingers and toes, and why they're tall and why they're into this. And perhaps some of you can relate to that. I personally don't think either look a lot like me, but Eve particularly looks a lot like Georgie, to a point where people sometimes get them muddled up. Even my own dad recently came and said, oh, hi, Georgie, and it was Eve. (laughs) But even if a child looks exactly or a lot like their parents, there's still going to be so much, isn't it, that's different, character, temperament, interest, gifting. But we see in this passage that actually when you come to Jesus, His character mirrors the Father completely. It's not like God the Father's like this and Jesus is like that. They are the same. It says in Corinthians that Christ is the image of God. In Hebrews 1, it says he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus himself said that he and the Father are one. So he is fully God and so fully shares God's character attributes, abilities. So all that Jesus said and did was a reflection exactly of what God the Father is like. You think about the compassion and kindness that Jesus showed, the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding he had, the way he associated with all people, including those outcasts from society, his miracles, healing, power over evil spirits, his holiness, living a perfect life, his obedience and willingness to lower himself in order to restore humanity to a relationship. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples, if you want to see the Father, look at me. I love how um, Dane Ortland in his book, Gentle and Lowly, excellent book, again, another recommendation, he puts it like this. He says, in Jesus, we see heaven's eternal heart walking around on two legs in time and space. I think that's a powerful image. So, what does this mean to us today? If you go back to that passage in John 1, it says, to all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. 
So what it means to us is that we are invited into this incredible relationship that we see in the Trinity. A God of infinite love who has created us out of that love has provided a way for us to join with him. That greatest demonstration of of God's heart is through Jesus offering himself in our place. Remember Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's Jesus that offers us a way to the Father believing that he is the only way. One of the most well-known passages in scripture is John 3, 16. I'm sure many know it off by heart. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would never perish but have eternal life. And there it is again. Do you see it? The Father's love demonstrated through the Son that leads to life for those who believe. Jesus said these words to a man named Nicodemus who was a Jewish ruler. And it's here where he explains to him, you've got to be born again to see the kingdom of God. And that's what it means to be a child of God, to be born spiritually of God, to enter into relationship with the Father through faith in the Son. Now, if you just think about Nicodemus, I don't know if you know much about him, but he would have been an old man. He would have been highly educated, a very well-respected man, a teacher, a Jewish ruler, He would have lived an extremely disciplined life. He would have been very moral, and he would have obeyed everything that the Lord would have taught. And yet, Jesus says to him, you need to be born again. Jesus is telling him that actually, nothing you have done will get yourself right with God. You can't make yourself right, because it's not about you. You can't earn it. The only way to be saved, to be born again, is to believe in the Son and become a child. And if it's true for someone like Nicodemus, it's true for us all. It says there in John 1 that this birth will be not of blood, not of the will of flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. So this means that neither physical birth, ethnic descent, human efforts, nothing like that can make us children of God. It's only by God's supernatural work. But also the flip side of the wonderful news is that it's available to us all. Amen? But we are, surely we're all children of God, you might be asking. You know, if God is the creator and he made us, then surely we're automatically sons and daughters. Yes and no. Paul addressed this topic when uh, he went to Athens. You can read, it in, in, read about it in Acts. He was discussing with the, uh, the Athenians about what God is like. And he said these words. He said, we are all indeed God's offspring because God gave life and breath to all mankind. But then he also teaches them that they need a relationship with Jesus. There's a big difference between being an offspring and understanding your relationship as a child. Think about the prodigal son again. You know, he was the rich man's offspring and he was happy to enjoy the the riches of being the child of that rich man. But actually it wasn't until he returned before he understood what it meant to be a son. And if you know the story, there's another son in, in there as well. The older son who stayed, who served, who worked hard. When the prodigal son returns, the older son's quite angry. And he says, look at me. Look how I served you. Look at everything I've done for you. And you don't put a feast on for me. But the father is patient with him as well, isn't he? He reminds him that actually now everything belongs to him. It's right to celebrate a brother who was lost and now found. And these wonderful words the father says to him, He says, the most important thing is that you will always be with me. If you think about the contrast, one of them is at rock bottom, lost everything. The other one is reliable and has everything. Yet they both missed that relationship with Father, didn't they? One was selfish, rejected his father, but yet there's nothing that he could do to make his father love him less. The other one worked incredibly hard, but actually there was nothing he could do to make his father love him anymore. With nothing left, the younger son came back and said, actually, I'll just be a servant. But actually, the older son was no different in his attitude. He, despite having everything, still had the slave's mindset. And that's what Paul refers to in Galatians 4, when he says that through God's son, we have received adoption as sons. We are no longer slaves, but actually we're heirs to God alongside Jesus himself. I love how uh, J.I. Packer sums it up in his book, um, Knowing God. 
He says, God adopts us out of his free love, not because our character and record shows us worthy to bear his name, but despite that they show the opposite. We are not fit for a place in God's family. The idea of his loving and exalting us sinners as he loves and has exalted the Lord Jesus sounds ludicrous and wild, but yet that is nothing less than that. Sorry, but yet that and nothing less than that is exactly what our adoption means. I think I agree with J.R. Packer. It is ludicrous and wild to think that we could be treated as Jesus the Son is. But that's the truth. To be a child of God, to put faith in him, means that we are treated as one of the family. We become co-heirs with Christ. We take on the family likeness and become more like Christ in the way we live. We have a father who provides our needs. Not that that means he gives us everything he wants. You know, think of that as a parent. Which parent gives their child everything they ask for without risking spoiling them? And we also have a father who disciplines us. Again, one perhaps we don't always want to hear. But actually, it's an example of God's loving heart towards us. And if you read Hebrews 12, it's actually a sign that we're a child if he disciplines us. So there's an invitation today. If you don't identify as a child of God, if you wouldn't say you're a Christian, then actually there's an invitation today to respond and to put your faith in Christ. And I'd love to pray with you afterwards, or perhaps you could talk with the person who brought you. But also for all of us who already know that we are saved, actually it's a fresh reminder of God's love towards us today. My last point I'd like to discuss this morning. What happens to children? Hopefully, they grow up, and perhaps they might go on to have children themselves. One generation produces the next, doesn't it? It's an opportunity to take what we've learned and inherited from previously and pass it on to those who come after us. As children of God, we can honor our Father by sharing his love for us with those around us. I like what Jesus says in John 15. He says, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And in verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. Notice that cascade of love. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves his disciples and says disciples love others. It's passing it on. We have our part to play, don't we, in sharing the love of God, the joy and knowledge of him. I don't know in your family if you have any of those recipes that have been passed on from generation to generation, or perhaps those funny stories or important stories that, you've, that your grandparents told you and actually now it's your responsibility to pass them on. Or perhaps it's that skill. I think there's a picture there, shaving, I was thinking about. My dad taught me to shave. It's my responsibility to teach my son to shave. We pass these things on, don't we? If you read what Paul says in Corinthians 1, 4, he saw himself as a father to the church. He said this, For I became, I became your father in Christ through, through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That's why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in, in the church. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Again, Paul would have known himself as a child of God, and yet he also sees himself as a father to the church. You can hear that love and affection, can't you, for his, for his spiritual son, Timothy, who he raised in faith and then sent him to pass it on to others. And that's the challenge for us all, isn't it? Paul's challenge is to live a life of faith as he did and to raise up others around us as well to teach, encourage, love, support, to disciple, and guide other people. Like being an earthly parent, being a spiritual parent is a great responsibility and privilege to imitate Christ in a way that others would want to follow. I just want to finish just with sharing some thoughts I had on this idea of legacy. Earlier in the year, my granddad passed away, sadly, just a few days after his 91st birthday. He had been a Christian his whole life, um, since he was a child, and he was still helping to organize and run things in his local church, even up until uh, the very end. He had four children, including my mum, 10 grandchildren, 13 great-grandchildren. And what's wonderful, in that part of the family, there's so many of us who are Christian, who are walking with God. 
And that's something that we really remembered when we had his service. And we were all talking about what a godly example he led us, led for us, how he loved his family, how he served the church his whole life. And actually, looking around at those who were there, actually so many of them have followed in his, in his path. And I was just really thinking about the fact that he is led by an example and how we followed, followed on from him. In a similar way, but slightly different, my granddad's sister, my aunt, she also sadly passed away in the, in the pandemic. And she loved Jesus too, since she was a child, and her passion for Jesus was infectious. She remained single all her life. She never married and had, or had children. But as a young woman, she helped organize Christian camps uh, and youth activities through the schools she worked in as a teacher and through the church. And she did that for most of her life. And what was amazing at her Thanksgiving service was story after story after story of women who she had brought to the Lord during her life. She had been a spiritual mother to so many, even though she had never had her own physical children. So in both ways, they led so many by their example. We may not all be biological parents, but we can be spiritual fathers and mothers to others, can't we? As we share the love of the Father as we imitate Christ the Son. Amen? Amen. So can I invite the band to come back up? So in closing today, on this Father's Day, let's think about all these things we have to celebrate. Let's celebrate our Heavenly Father who gave us life and who continues to sustain us and who has not and will not ever stop loving us. Let's celebrate that Christ came to show us the Father and offers us, offers us a way to be his children. Let's celebrate those who have raised us And let's celebrate those who have led us in Christ, those spiritual mothers and fathers. And then finally, let's pray that God would help us find our place to play in the family of God, to play our part as we love and support one another around us. Amen? Can I encourage you to stand? And I'd love to pray for us all. Heavenly Father, we thank you on this Father's Day that we can look to you, our perfect loving Heavenly Father. We just thank you for the way that you love us unconditionally, the way you have not and will never stop loving us. We thank you you gave us life. We thank you that you sent your Son. We thank you that in Christ we see the image of the Father. We just thank you that we can be children of God, not because of anything we do or could ever do, but because we put our trust in you. Father God, help us to imitate Christ. Help us to live in a way that would lead others to you. Help us to live in a way that we can bless and lead those around us and the next generation. Father God, we just thank you today on this Father's Day. We just honor you as the most perfect father that we could know. Bless you, Lord. Amen.
Father, thank you that you have made a way for us to know you, for us to come not just as your creation, but to, to come as your children, as your beloved sons and daughters into your presence. And Lord, we just thank you for that. And Lord, we just pray you would pour out your spirit more and more on each of us today, Lord God, and you'd help us as we go out to share your great love with the world around us. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just before I bring the meeting to a close, you know, Father God loves to meet with us. He loves to speak to us. If you're here this morning and you need healing, or you want someone to pray for you for healing, then please come to this uh, space over here. Someone's had a, a word about someone with a, a, a sprained wrist, uh, someone who's had a lump discovered that you're worried about. Uh, there's also someone here that has constant headaches, um, uh, someone else with a sudden loss of energy. I mean, if this is all one person, it's quite a lot of things, isn't it? But uh, I think it's different people they've got, got these for. Uh, and somebody struggling with tunnel vision. Um, uh, but yeah, basically, if you want healing for anything, please uh, come forward. There'll be people over here at the front uh, left to pray with you. Also, someone, um, they've felt that they... Um, your life, where you feel this about your life, like a rope with lots of knots in it, and the knots represent lots of troubles that you don't know how to deal with. And just to come forward and receive prayer, because God wants to uh, help you in that. And of course, finally, Father's Day can bring up a lot of things for people. If you want someone just to stand with you and pray uh, through some of these uh, issues that you're uh, that you struggle with, then again, there'll be people down at the front uh, left up here to, to pray with you through those things. Otherwise, going to close the meeting there. Tea and coffee will be served in a minute. If you're a guest here, there is a welcome zone at the back left over there where you can uh, uh, be welcomed and you don't have to queue for tea and coffee. Um, but other than that, have a great week. Enjoy uh, your week and we'll see you soon. And if you can remember to take the tags off the back of the chairs, that would be most helpful. Thanks, guys.